Next, I'll um, touch upon some of the uh, challenges in reinforcement learning. Of course, I've already mentioned a couple during. Um, but just to be clear, so this was actually a question that was just asked right now as well. I talked about learning and planning, but I didn't really define these very concretely, and this is more or less deliberately so, um, because these terms are somewhat fuzzy in the literature. Um, if you ask many people to define, say, planning for you, they might give you quite different answers. So one distinction that you could make is that for learning, the environment is initially unknown, and the agent then interacts with the environment in order to learn. Whereas for planning, a model of the environment is given, and then the agent plans in this model without external interaction. And this is sometimes also called reasoning, pondering, thought, search, or planning, depending on who you ask. Some of these terms are maybe a little bit more concrete or technical than others. Um, the main distinction is whether you consume the data to do new things. I would, I would say something is learning when it can consume new data and use that to improve its internal representation its internal policy, its or internal knowledge, any of those. Whereas planning is more something that happens internally without the additional data coming in. And of course, these things can be combined. You could be learning, and at the same time, in maybe something like a background process, you could be planning to improve the, uh, the results coming out of the system as a whole. So more terminology, I already mentioned those terms, but let's also be clear about those, is uh, the difference between prediction and control. And these are distinct goals that you might have. We've to mostly talked about control. Control is a word that is used to basically mean find the optimal solution. It comes obviously from control theory. Um, and sometimes this can, can be slightly confusing because some people think of controlling something means to keep it in a certain state. And indeed, a lot of control theory applications are like that, where you want to keep a plant in a certain state, a certain equilibrium, a certain thing that doesn't go haywire. Uh, but we use it more generally to also find something that just optimizes your return. Prediction, separately from that, is to evaluate the future, to be able to predict what's going to happen. And these are, of course, uh, first off, they're strongly related to the concepts that we talked about. Prediction it can be encoded in terms of value functions, and control can be encoded in terms of an, uh, an optimal or an approximately optimal policy. And they're strongly related in the sense that if you maximize overall value functions, if you could somehow do this, for all, for all policies, then the optimal policy would be the maximum uh, policy over, uh, sorry, would, would have the maximum value over all policies. So again, this is a question that I posed at the beginning. If we could predict everything, do we need anything else? It's kind of an open question. It's kind of hinting towards an answer though. So what we'll want to do is we'll want to learn components of an agent. And Specifically, we also know that these components are basically all functions. Policies map states to actions. Value functions map states to values, which are basically just numbers. Models map states to states and or rewards, which are again just numbers. And state updates uh, map states and observations to new states. And all of these are just functions. So what one, one way we could progress is we could model these functions as learnable functions, for instance, as neural networks, and then use a learning mechanism, for instance, uh, by using the research from deep learning to then update these functions. And this is a fairly popular approach these days, actually. <coughs> However, we often violate standard assumptions for supervised learning and statistics, and it's good to be aware of that. For instance, if you use some uh, methods to do your, um, your value prediction, you could use a standard regression method to do that. But many regression algorithms, they assume that the inputs and uh, outputs labels that you get are uh, IID, independent uh, and identically distributed. And also we typically assume that the, the world is stationary when we do supervised learning. Basically there's one mapping that you're trying to find and it stays the same. And in reinforcement learning we typically violate these. One clear way in which we violate that, these is when we try to do uh, prediction and control. So we're trying to improve our policy while trying to predict things about the future which is actually a very common thing that we want to do. But that means that our, uh, our predictions, which might be conditional on our current policy, will become somewhat outdated, they become stale. They might not be completely accurate anymore. The data that comes in is not stationary. It, it depends on the current policy. Moreover, and maybe even more importantly, the data coming in is not IID, it's not, it's not identically distributed. It'll be sequential data, so actually 
the data coming in from one science step to the other might be very correlated. And standard regression methods may or may not deal well with that. So deep reinforcement learning, which is basically the field of research which uh, um, deals with combining reinforcement learning, combining these concepts with deep learning as a tool to then learn these functions, is a very rich and active research field because you can plug in learnings from deep learning in many places in reinforcement learning. You can identify these things as being functions and then try to learn these functions by defining a well-defined loss function on them. But then still you have to be aware that you're doing something slightly different from what people are typically doing in, say, deep learning. So not the same methods might apply equally uh, well. Um, I also, of course, want to say, say explicitly, neural networks are not always the best tool to solve something. This is the hope of some people, at least. But they do often work quite well, so it's worthwhile to consider, uh, consider them. So an example, as said before, the, uh, the Atari games were actually learned uh, with reinforcement learning, but specifically they were learned with, were learned with deep reinforcement learning. Mm. And schematically, it looks a little bit like, like this. There's an observation, which is just the raw pixels of the screen, in this case. And the action, the output action, is an, uh, a joystick action. And this may somewhat be somewhat misleading, this picture, because this joystick kind of looks an, uh, as if it's... Uh, uh, an analog thing, but it isn't actually. There's only eight directional actions that the joystick can read, and then there's this fire button. So you could either not move or move in any of these eight directions, and then you could do the same nine things, but then pressing the fire button at the same time. So in total, there's 18 different actions. So it's actually a discrete action space. And then the goal is to pick actions in the joystick that improve the rewards, especially the cumulative discounted uh, future reward, and the rewards are defined as the change in score from one time step to the next. And this means in particular that if we wouldn't discount, then the accumulation of these rewards would just be your score at the end. So that seems like a fairly natural thing to uh, try to achieve in these Atari games. Now, we were talking about learning versus planning. So in Atari, for instance, you could also think about planning instead of learning. The rules of the game could be known, and we could query the emu emulator, which is a perfect model. Actually, it turns out to be the case that Atari is also deterministic, so that makes it easier, because it's not a huge branching factor in that sense. There's, there's still a fairly big branching factor in terms of the number of actions you can pick, but there's not additionally also noise coming into play. So you can actually take an action and then see what, what, what ends, ends up being the case, and you can repeat that process, you can search this whole tree. But of course, you can only do this if you have access to the simulator, and this turns out to be harder, because if you say, play, this, play one of these Atari games, if you try an action, you're already at the next screen, and you can't go back. So this requires you to first have a model in order to do that. Um, that said, it works actually quite well if you do this on Atari. You don't even have to look at the screen. You can just uh, build a whole tree of all the actions. You could find, because it's deterministic, it's not that big a tree. It's still fairly big, but it's not that big. And then you could just plan through this tree, and see if you can find good scores. Um, typically, we don't want to do that because this kind of overfits to the determinism of the domain. And in a stochastic domain, this wouldn't work that well. So what we typically do, we use algorithms that could also be applied to a stochastic domain, and then hopefully they still like they, they work in both these cases. And later versions of the uh, Atari emulator that we use, um, both in DeepMind and externally, uh, later versions also add noise. They basically make the actions that you take a little bit sticky. So sometimes the, the actions take a little longer or a little shorter, which means you can't predict exactly what the next state will be deterministically from uh, just a state and an action. In order to learn, we must get useful information. And one very important challenge and current active area of research within reinforcement learning is uh, the topic of exploration, as we often call it. But it's actually maybe more precisely called the topic of exploration and exploitation. Um, and the idea is basically this. We want to learn by trial and error. We want to learn by interaction. It's a different way to say the same thing. And the agent should discover a good policy from new experiences and without sacrificing too much reward along the way. Now, this trying to discover something, that's the exploration part. You're trying to discover new things that can help you build more information, that can help you build good internal value functions and policies and whatnot. And you want these to be um, 
informed by as much as you can by different interactions with the world. But if you explore too much, your performance will be quite poor. And additionally, you only see maybe in somewhat an uninteresting part of the state space. Think of a robot that can walk around, but it only like turns randomly, moves randomly. It might stick to a very small portion of the, uh, of the room, in a sense. So the alternative, what, what you could do, is you could maybe follow what you currently think is the best possible thing you could be doing. This is what we call exploitation. The benefit of that is that it gets you to new interesting states, and it gets you good results along the way, and this can be important, for instance, if you're learning online, it might be important not just to find a good solution, but also to be performing well while you are learning. And this is related to the distinction that I made earlier between the, the, the goal being either to find a solution or to adapt while you're finding a solution. And sometimes it's really important to perform well while you're trying to find something better. Think also, for instance, of this... Uh, advertising example that I gave earlier, where you're trying to place ads on a site, and this is, these are your actions. Maybe you don't want to lose too much reward along the way while trying to find the best possible policy to do that. So the, the problem then is how to balance off this exploration versus exploitation, and basically the truth of it is that we have excellent algorithms to do this in the simplest possible cases, where we have basically one state and only a bunch of actions. This is the multi-armed bandit settings. There we have, have uh, mechanisms that basically work optimally, in a sense. Which means that they don't, do, they don't take uh, suboptimal actions uh, more often than they need, and they take the optimal action basically as often as you possibly could with any learning algorithm, which is quite impressive. But it's a simpler case than the full reinforcement learning problem. For the full reinforcement learning problem, we, we don't have that yet. We don't have the best possible trade-off algorithms for exploration and exploitation. And it's a hard problem in general, so therefore it's also an active area of, of current research. So as I said, exploration is about finding more information, and exploitation exploits the known information to maximize the current reward. And it's important to do both. It's also good to note that this is a fundamental problem that is inherent to this interactive nature of reinforcement learning. It doesn't occur in supervised learning because there the data is already there. Now, of course, there is an, a, a, another subfield called active learning, which basically is about, oh, but how do you then select your data? And this is very related. So some, some simple examples. If, say, you're, uh, you're trying to find the best possible restaurants, your exploitation would say, go to what is currently your favorite. Exploration would be to try something completely new, maybe informed somehow. And then maybe this is better than anything you've ever seen. Like, there, you might go there again and again. Or, just to skip one and go to the last one, game playing, you might play the move that you currently believe is best, but sometimes you might want to try a new strategy, maybe try a move that you've never played before, just to see what happens. And this will give you more information. Might be a bad idea, you might never do it again. That's fine, right? So next time you might exploit in the same situation but it's important to trade these off. Okay. Now to make a lot of that a little bit concrete, a lot of the concepts that we've touched upon, here's another small example. Um, this is a small little tiny grid world where you can move in all of the four directions. And you get minus one when you bump into a wall. And there's a discount factor here as well, of 0.9. And you can get some positive rewards. Basically, if you go into state A, and then you take any action from that state, Instead of moving in that direction, it'll transport you to this state A prime at the bottom, and you'll get a reward of plus 10. Similarly, when you're in state B and you take any action there, you'll transport to B prime, and you'll get a reward of plus 5. Now, to the right-hand side there, we see the value function for the uniform random policy in this problem. And basically what we see is that the, uh, the value of the state A is the highest of all of them which makes a lot of sense because it's just before you get a large reward, and there's a discount factor, so you care more about near-term reward than, uh, uh, than uh, later rewards. If we wouldn't have a discount factor here, there's no termination, so your values would be infinite, potentially, which would be maybe a bit of a problem. So the, the discount factor here makes sure that the values are well-defined, but they also are a somewhat natural thing. You want your high rewards fast. Now we can also ask what the optimal value function is and what the optimal policy is for this problem. And it might not be immediately obvious because you could go to state A and then get a pretty high reward repeatedly, but it transports you back, transports you quite a bit away. Whereas if you go to B, you only get bumped two states away and you can go back and get this 
lower reward of plus five, but you can get it more often. So it's an interesting question to say, well, well where should I actually go, A or B? There's a trade-off here. But it turns out if you solve this, there's a clear winner, which is that the value in state A is definitely higher than the value in state B. So even if you're in, the, in exactly in the middle between those two, if you look at the, uh, all the way at the right-hand side, there's two of these states, they have arrows in all directions. This is because any action in state A and any action in state B will lead to the uh, corresponding state that you transport to. But if you look to the, to the state in the middle at the top row, it has a, an arrow pointing left because the value of state A is actually higher than the value of state B. Now this is a function of the discount factor and of these rewards that you get on these uh, transitions. The main thing that's, uh, that this is intended to highlight is that it's sometimes not obvious what the actual uh, optimal solution is, but you can find it automatically and then uh, just follow that. It turns out that the optimal policy doesn't care, doesn't distinguish between many actions. There's ma oftentimes there's two arrows. This is because this is a very simple MDP, very symmetric in a sense, and you can often go left first and then up, or up first and then left, and it's exactly the same value. Now, of course, in many real-world problems, there will be slight differences, and it might not matter too much whether you go up or left first, but it might matter a little bit. In practice, we typically don't care necessarily about the optimal optimal solution, but we care about something that is pretty good, close to optimal rather than necessarily exactly optimal. Now, how did we solve this? How do we find these values? Yeah, question. Maybe you answer the question Okay, so how do we find these values? Well. This, this we could do with, with planning. We could use dynamic programming specifically. And I'll go a little bit into that. And then, as I have said before, I actually care more about learning algorithms myself than planning algorithms. But it's good to go through these things um, because they give you a very good intuition about what's going on with the learning algorithms as well. And they're also very good algorithms um, if, you can, if you can do them. So there's four main Bellman equations. Um, the first two are for state values. The very first defines the state value for a given policy pi. The second one defines the state value for the optimal policy, which we call V star. And, and there's basically two analogous versions for state action values. One is for the uh, current policy pi, or some given policy pi, and the other one's for the optimal policy star. And by definition, there can be no policy with a higher value than V star. This is assuming MDPs, Markov decision processes, so we can just think of the state as being the Markov state of the environment for now. There are, of course, equivalences between these two. In particular, the state value for a policy is the policy weighted sum of the action values for that same policy. And the optimal value is the maximum over uh, the optimal values for all actions. Now we can also talk about what it means to have an optimal policy. And in particular, we can define an ordering over the policies where we could say that the policy pi is better than the policy pi prime if it has a higher value in all states. Again, this is assuming the Markov uh, property holds, so we have a Markov decision process. And then for any Markov decision process, it turns out there exists an optimal policy that is better or equal to all other policies. So there's some pi prime that is, according to this ordering, larger or equal to all pi. And there can actually be more than one of such po policies. But all of these policies will have the same optimal value, V star. I see I turned the subscript into a superscript there, but it's still the same function. Sorry about that. So why, why can there be multiple possible policies? We actually already saw an example of that with that small little grid world over there, where going up and left actually has the same value as going left and up. So the policy of going up in that state and then following the optimal policy and the policy going left in that state and then following the optimal policy. They're different policies, but they do have the same value. Now, how do we find an optimal policy? Well, one very simple way to find it is to first find the optimal value. That part might be hard, but if you have the optimal values, then finding an optimal policy is trivial because you can just take the greedy action with respect to the optimal action values. And this is guaranteed to be an optimal policy. Which basically means that we can solve, if we can solve for the optimal value function, this is sufficient to, to find the optimal policy. There is always a deterministic optimal policy, 
for, for MDPs. As said before, maybe with the uh, adjective finite before there or not. Um, and if we know this uh, optimal value function, we have the optimal policy kind of trivially. Um, if multiple actions actually maximize Q star, because there can be multiple optimal policies, we can just pick an up action arbitrarily, including stochastically. It is allowed to have a stochastic policy then. But you could also pick a deterministically, which, which is why there's always, there is always a deterministic optimal policy. Now the Bellman optimality equation, let's go back and look at those. So the second equation here and the fourth equation here, they're nonlinear because they have a max in there. And that turns out to be important because um, the linear versions we can actually solve directly. For instance, by writing Rodano's matrices. This, these are fairly big vectors and matrices. If there's a vector of state values for all of the states here MDP, if you have a big MDP, that's a big vector. But you can solve the uh, Bellman equations analytically for that one. But for the nonlinear versions, you can't. And therefore, what we typically do for these nonlinear uh, uh, Bellman equations is that we solve them iteratively. This means that we build up solutions and then we incrementally improve these solutions over time by making more and more updates. I'll give you an example of that in a moment. There's many different iterative solution methods. And you, when you use models, you can use dynamic programming. So if you have, say, the true model of your problem, uh, then you can use dynamic programming, and in particular, you, you might use an algorithm called value iteration or one called policy iteration. If you don't have a model, you'll have to use samples, and then one way to go is to use a Monte Carlo sample, with which we you, which we mean, sorry, with which in reinforcement learning we mean a full Monte Carlo sample of the full return, typically. Or you could use algorithms called Q-learning or SARSA, which are sample-based algorithms to learn action values. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Yes? Uh, I'm assuming, I don't know if that's true, but the Bellman equation can have uh, multiple solutions. Is that true? Um, the Bellman equation, there's only one, for the Bellman optimality equation, there's only one optimal value function um, for the Markov decision process case. Um, which is because, well, one way to think about that, so it, 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 all of your states are kind of independent in some sense because they're Markov, so you can just think about the value of each state independently in a sense. Um, <clears throat> and then if you can do something to make that state value better, this will improve your policy overall according to the, to the, to the, to the ordering that we've defined. Because it will be the same in all states, but in this one state it's better, and then according to our definition that means it's a better, better policy. I guess you converge to some fixed point, but yes. you know it's the best fixed point. Do you so, any guarantees well, in general, so this is a very good question. So, in general, um, if you have a tabular representation, so you can uh, represent the value of each state independently, you can actually find the actual uh, optimal value function then. And uh, this is guaranteed to be the exact solution. Typically, we don't have that. So typically, you, you could be in either one of two other cases. One is where you have some features and you build a linear function off of that. And that one's actually pretty well understood still. And then there are indeed proofs that this will also, that certain methods will also then converge to a fixed point, which is well defined and we know what it is. So we can basically say uh, it'll definitely go there in the limits. If it's a sample-based method, you can't say much more than in the limit. You could say something about the rate, of course, but it's never going to be exactly there because of the noise. But if you decay your step sizes appropriately, you do know that it will end up at that fixed point eventually. For nonlinear functions, there's less known, essentially, as always. But for the linear case, actually, that's already a pretty strong one. And the tabular case also, that you can show that, the, that they go there, is actually non-trivial results, and it's quite interesting. And so I'll, I'll give you an algorithm that does that, um, which is uh, a dynamic programming algorithm. I thought this quote was quite fun. I'll just read it out loud. Uh, this is by Richard Bellman. Uh, the 1950s were not good years for mathematical research. I felt I had to shield the Air Force from the fact that I was really doing mathematics. What title, what name could I choose? I was interested in planning, in decision making, in thinking. But planning is not a good word for various reasons. I decided to use the word programming. I wanted to get across the idea that this was dynamic, this was time varying. I thought, let's kill two birds with one stone. Let's take a word that has a precise meaning, namely dynamic, in a classical physical sense, 
it is also impossible to use the word dynamic in a pejor pejorative sense. Try thinking of some combination that will possibly give it a pejorative meaning. It's impossible. Thus I thought dynamic programming was a good name. It was something that even a congressman could object to. So I used it as an umbrella for my activities. So this kind of shows, because this name is sometimes a little bit confusing, why dynamic programming is called dynamic programming. And maybe it's somewhat of an arbitrary term and uh, not very descriptive. There's a different definition in the, uh, uh, the book by Sutton and Barto, which is uh, a very good reference for reinforcement learning. If you want to read more about anything that I said today, go read that book. Um, it's called Reinforcement Learning and Introduction. And Rich defines it as, uh, uh, sorry, Rich Sutton, defines it as dynamic programming refers to a collection of algorithms that can be used to compute optimal policies given a perfect model of the environment as a mark of decision process. And so I'll next discuss a couple of methods uh, that can be used to solve the Markov decision process. And all such methods basically consist of two important parts, which are policy evaluation and policy improvement. And this actually, the reason why this is important, one is to understand where all these other methods come from. For instance, these sampling-based methods that I personally do more research on. But it's also important to understand that these parts actually are also important for all our other methods as well, for our sampling-based methods as well. Okay, so first we'll briefly discuss how to estimate the value of a certain policy. And the idea is quite simple. We have an equation there. This is an equality, the top one there. And the idea is to turn it into an update. We initialize our value at some initial random guess, v0. For instance, or maybe I should say arbitrary rather than random. For instance, we set it to zero for all states. And then what we can do, we can iterate this equation over here, which says that vk plus one, is going to be set equal to the expectation of the immediate reward plus the discounted value at the next state according to our previous estimates vk. Now note that if vk plus one equals vk for all states, we must have found the value as defined up there because apparently we had an equality. And now the non-trivial part, but it is true, is that it actually goes there eventually. It will become equal. Importantly, we are using bootstrapping. This is a term that is used in reinforcement learning a lot, which refers to the fact that we're using this value of the previous iteration to stand in for the remainder of the return. What is one alternative thing that we could do? We could not do that, and we could just write the whole discounted return there, and if we did that, we didn't even need to iterate. We could just do it in one go. But this requires you to compute that expectation which might have a huge branching factor. You're basically building the whole tree of possibilities and then backing that all the way up into your value. And that's, that can be quite expensive. Whereas this one step only requires you to look one, one action into the future. You do have to replace the return then with something else uh, because we don't have the full return. We didn't compute it. And for that, we're using our current estimates for the value of that state. Now, does this always converge? And the answer is yes, under appropriate conditions. For instance, the discount factor should be smaller than one for the, for the general case. And here's a very simple proof sketch for the continuing discounted case. And what we'll do is we'll look at, for, for all states, we'll look at the maximum difference between the value uh, of any state, therefore we're maxing over states, uh, the difference between the value at, at vk plus one and the actual value of that state. And now we just expand both of those in their definitions. So vk plus one was defined as a one-step look-ahead with the reward and then vk right, that we're bootstrapping upon. Whereas the actual true value, we can expand similarly into one step and then bootstrapping on the actual true value. We use the actual true value at the next state. Now we know that the rewards are actually equal. We're, we have the expected reward there. And the expectation, uh, we can just pull the reward out. It's uh, the expectation of a sum, it's just a sum of two expectations, which means we can just subtract these rewards from each other, they disappear. Then what, what's left is the expectation of the uh, value at the next state according to vk, and the value at the next state according to our true value function. And then we know that we can actually pull the discount factor all the way outside, because it just multiplies both of these. This is for a fixed constant discount factor, which is the same everywhere, for simplicity. And then we note that we can write this uh, at the bottom. We can do an inequality, basically, because we have a max over all states of an expectation over a next state. 
which you can re just replace by just doing max over all states. And now note that the discount factor there in front is a number that is smaller than one. So this means that if we repeat this process over and over again, and we don't actually have to repeat it that often, that the difference between vk plus one and vpi will become very small, become small to zero. And when it's zero, this means that we have found the actual values. Yes? What is vpi exactly? So vpi is the actual uh, value of following policy pi. So it's the expected one step reward plus the discounted value at the next state, or equivalently, it's just the expectation of the full discounted return if you follow that policy. Thanks. You could also similarly prove that the, uh, somebody asked this earlier, that the um, episodic case, the undiscounted episodic case, that that one also converges, but that, that's a bit harder to prove. Um, but it also goes through, so it still converges to the right answer. Now here's an example, again, small grid world. You get minus one on all the transitions. And, uh, sorry, these two corner, shaded corner states are terminal states. Basically, the episode ends there. It's, again, a simple problem. And let's say we start with a uniformly random policy. And we start with a value function that is zero everywhere. Now, we take this random policy on every step. Uh, in, in every state, we take this random policy because this algorithm was defined to update all the states at the same time. Which, of course, you can only do if it's small enough, but here we can. So we update all of the state values, and all of them go to a next state. But what we're going to do is we're going to peg the values of these terminal states to zero. Because these are states that you can never escape from again. We're basically going to say things stop there, so we're just going to set the value to zero. You're never going to get any more rewards when you enter these terminal states. This is how typically episodic problems are defined. Now, in each of the states that we could do something, we get a minus one, because the rewards are always minus one. And from this, we had a new policy as well, because now we can reason about a one-step look-ahead uh, on the value function to see from each state what is the value of the action going to the next state. Because we have access to the full model, we can just reason through that. We can just see deterministically which state we end up, and we can just pick that action. And what we notice is that we now know from the states next to the terminal states that the terminal states are actually preferred over staying where you are or going to some other state because their value has been back to zero, and the other states now have a lower value. Now, if you repeat this over and over again, you can see that uh, more structure starts to appear, and actually after three iterations, we've already found the optimal policy, which maybe is not too surprising, because in this situation, from each state, within three steps, you can reach a terminal state. So in this case, three backups is enough. The value function keeps on changing still for a while. And all the way in the limit, it will find the... Um, uh, the true values of the random policy, because that's what we were doing here. And at the same time, basically... Sorry, I should have been clear about that on the get-go. So the policy here on the, on the right-hand side is the current greedy policy with respect to that value function on the left. But we're not evaluating that policy. We're evaluating the random policy over and over again. So in this case, all the way at the end, we get the values of the random policy, and we get the policy that corresponds to then maximizing that one step. And this is something that we will call policy improvement. And incidentally, in this case, being greedy with respect to the random values will actually get you the optimal policy. So this example shows that we can use evaluation, even of the random policy in this case, to then improve our policy. And in fact, just being greedy with respect to these values, the actual values of the random policy, in this case, were sufficient to get an optimal policy. That is not true in general. Often you have to iterate this process a couple of times, where you then make your policy a bit more greedy with respect to the current values, and then re-evaluate that policy, and then repeat. So this means we can iterate the policies as well. We can first learn the actual values. Let's say we pick action values here for simplicity of use. And then we learn the actual Q pi, which is defined as the value of taking action A and then following, say, your current policy pi. And then we can construct a new policy from this by being greedy with respect to these values. And if you do that, you can actually show that the value of this new policy will be an improvement over the value of the previous policy. <coughs> 
if it's not the case, because there wasn't an improvement, then they, then they can at least be equal. They cannot become, it cannot become worse by definition, because we're maxing over something. So the only, only alternative is that the value of your new policy is equal to the value of your old policy. But that then implies something that is essentially exactly our Bellman optimality equation. So whenever the improvement stops, what this means is whenever your improvement stops, whenever a new policy does not attain a higher value according to this process, then you must have found the optimal policy. So not only does this process find the optimal policy, you can actually tell when it has found the optimal policy, which is quite useful. Of course, this is restricted to the full planning case where we have access to the full model and each policy evaluation step we consume all of the states and we even assumed that we found the complete answer to the value of each policy. And this is then schematically you can depict it as this, where we start at some combination of policy and value and the first step we do is we go up, which means we find a value that is the true value for that current policy. And then we make that greedy, the, the policy, and then we reevaluate that new policy. And this is a schematic drawing that doesn't really mean anything, the, the, the space here, but what, what, is meant to, uh, uh, what is meant to show essentially is that in some sense these things will then move closer and closer together. At some, st some point they'll stop, stop changing. And when that happens, this means you've found the optimal value and the optimal policy. And that's the only place in which they could stop. Yeah? Could you start iterating with any random policy? You don't have a, a lattice of policies or you, you know can which one is the worst? Or? No, you could start with any random policy. You don't have to start informed. But this is exploiting the fact that we're updating all of the states, even if the policy that you're evaluating would never reach one of those states. Right? We're still updating its value. If you're going to do something sample-based, this won't work. Right? Your random policy will simply not go to certain states, so you won't be able to learn from them. So this is uh, limited to the full model case. The same picture as on the left is kind of like meant to be depicted on the right, where at first these things are different. From a certain policy you get a value. From that value you can get a different new policy. You can do that over and over again. At some point they stop changing and you found the optimal. Alternatively, what we actually did for the policy evaluation, let me go back to that, is we turned this equality up there, the Bellman equality, into an update. Now we could also, this is for the Bellman uh, evaluation equation where we're interested in the value for a certain policy. Now we could also take the Bellman optimality equation and turn that into an update. Sorry, this is over here. The Bellman optimality equation has this maximization over actions. And actually this turns out to be equivalent to the policy iteration algorithm that we've just described, where policy iteration combines a policy evaluation step with a policy improvement step. And this is equivalent to doing one step of policy evaluation because that, that, that term there on the right hand side behind the max A is basically doing one step of policy, uh, uh, policy evaluation on the current policy. Um, but then doing immediately greedy, uh, then immediately maxing over that in, in the actions. So, so you don't have to then commit to the current policy anymore because this one step is fully defined by the action. We can condition on this action. Sorry, there's a small typo there. Of course, it should say ST is S and then S -A -A -T is A, where that's the same A as, on the, uh, as in the max. So can we fall into the local optimum? Turns out no, not for full dynamic programming, um, which is quite interesting. The, the little proof there for the policy evaluation case, something similar you can prove for the policy uh, for this one, where you can show that it's actually a contraction, which means that it'll keep on getting better until it's the same, and then you find the optimal uh, solution. So that's a non-trivial result again, and it's quite interesting, but it's also quite nice because it means you can just apply these and be assured that you're going to find the optimal solution. Yes? Is that true even if you have an infinite state space? Is that true with an infinite state space? Well, yeah, if you could do these things, but you can't, right? Because they require you to do update all of the states uh, at the same time. For infinite state space, you could either sample that, and there are asynchronous dynamic program algorithms that do that, or you could maybe somehow maybe cluster them, 
And then you could find like a different MVP, which kind of maps to the real MVP that you're interested in, and then solve that. But of course, if you would do that, the solution to that wouldn't necessarily be optimal to the original thing anymore. And more generally, if you have infinite states, you're going to have to make some approximation somewhere, which means that you might lose an optimality just for computational reasons. Barring very simple, like there, there could be cases in which you could do something like that and actually make it computationally feasible because you can update infinite states at the same time somehow. Sometimes you can, but not for very interesting cases, I would say. And so we're going to now do this, this update with the max. This is the development optimality equation turned into an update. This is called value iteration. And we're going to apply that to a shortest path problem where the idea is, again, that you get a minus one on each step. It's undiscounted. And now the goal is here to find the goal, which is that terminal state on the left up corner. It's very similar to the other one, only we have one goal now instead of two. And then we find that we start off with, uh, well, it's here V1. I, I guess I called that V0 before. We start off with uh, initially first only zeros everywhere. And then we apply this equation once, this update, and we get a minus one everywhere because the first step is always minus one. But then on the second step, we see that the minus ones don't change anymore because the, their optimal thing is still to go to the terminal state immediately. But everything that can go to those or to any other state will go to minus two. But then the minus two don't change anymore because they have a shortest path. The minus two leads to minus one leads to zero. And after a couple of iterations, you can see them basically tracing back with as many steps as you need to find the goal. You'll find a certain value function. And if you update v on v v7 again, you would see no more change, which means that this must be the optimal value function. And in this case, of course, it clearly is. It's very interpretable. Now, dynamic programming is great, but it does require a full model, and therefore it's mainly applicable to a small or moderately sized domains, as we briefly discussed just now. So we want two additional capabilities. One, we want to be able to learn from sampled interactions. Um, and the, the second is, we do not want to require a model. So sampling is important for two reasons. One is that it doesn't require a model, so you could say, aren't these the same thing? Well, no. I also, I wanted to say them separately because you could also have a very big model. You do have access to the model, but it's just too big to reason about, then you probably still want to sample. It's still useful to sample. And both of these are achievable. And in order to talk about that, I'll switch to a different slide deck. Um, just for my own convenience, no real semantic reasons. So what do we want? We want algorithms that can learn from samples and or interaction with the world, rather than say only learning by planning. We want to be able to deal with real world problems, which often have messy inputs and outputs. And for instance, think of a robot which just has like a noisy camera sensor and that's about it. It doesn't have real state. You can't reason about planning through an MDP. Um, we want to deal with large problems where even on a robot with a small camera, you typically have hundreds of, uh, uh, well, not hundreds, you typically have uh, tens of thousands of pixels, at least. And often even like more than that. And you have to somehow deal with that fairly large, this is just your immediate input, right? That's just your observation. It's already a thousands dimensional real valued space, potentially. And you want to somehow deal with that. And we want to learn with little, little domain knowledge. This is just, this is maybe more an aesthetics thing. It's important for certain things. Definitely, if you have a certain problem that you want to solve, a specific problem, it never hurts to put more domain knowledge in it. You should definitely exploit it as much as you can. But what I'm personally interested in, and what we're interested in, in more generally in reinforcement learning, is to find very general methods that you can use on many different uh, problems. And that also allow you maybe in some ways to put in domain knowledge on all of the different problems, but then you can maybe still share the mechanisms, the learning, learning algorithms, for instance. So let me see if this works. So this is an example of something. Oh. No, I don't think I can. Let me see if I can make it work by going out of the slide deck. It might work like this. Nope, still won't work. So what is this? I'll just uh, hand wave and tell you then what your what your uh, you can use your imagination, which might be even more fun, um, especially if the slide deck isn't returning. That's, uh, um, what, what that was what, what this was, was meant to show was an agent walking through a three D uh, maze environment. Let me just start here. 
And the point there being that the agent can only see its immediate surroundings. It can see the walls and it can walk around and it can turn, but it can't see around the corner. And it can't see everything there is to know. And in addition, the, 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 the inputs, the visual inputs are quite rich, right? They're a lot of pixels. And for us, it's quite obvious what's going on because we're used to looking at these things. But if you think about it from the robot's point of view, there's like a whole bunch of different numbers. You don't know what they mean. What, what is brown? Brown is like this one number compared to green is like this different number. Actually, there are typically like three numbers encoding each of these colors, like RGB uh, numbers. And you don't know any, what any of this means. And then you just have to go to, you're going to have to deal with that as an agent. And these videos were actually meant to show I think the whole slide deck's not working anymore, so I'm just going to go like this. Um, these videos were then meant to show that uh, the agent walking around, and this was actually done with, an, with a reinforced learning algorithm, so the agent has learned to deal with that. This is a different example. What you see here is a gripper arm. It basically has a bunch of uh, motors in all of the joints, so it can turn this joint, it can turn that joint, and then the goal is to pick up a ball and to place it to some target location. And then we'll just change the goal. So we change the position of the ball, we change the position of the target location, and it needs to do it again. And it gets rewarded for putting the ball on top of the target location, or alternatively for just bringing it as close as it possibly can. This is a continuous control problem where actually the actions are in the continuous space of these motor controls. And again, this was done with a reinforcement learning algorithm. And here's an example of such an algorithm. So this is again the Bauman optimality equation, this time for action values. And we can also turn this, uh, we already mentioned that we can turn it into an update, right? By just putting like k plus one on one side and then k on the other side. But we could also turn it into a stochastic update, a sampled update. This is a temporal difference algorithm. That's a term that Rich Sutton coined to describe the whole family of these algorithms. And temporal difference learning works by looking at the temporal difference between the reward and the value at the next state and the value at your current state. So that's this whole term between the brackets. And you can kind of think of this as an error. So the value at your current state, or state action pair in this case, we want that to be equal to the actual reward and value of the next state. And we'll try to make that equal by just incrementally updating it towards it. That's a way to interpret this, uh, this equation. If at some point the terms between these brackets, the reward, sorry, the value of the state and action pair is equal to the reward plus the value at the next state, then that term will be zero and we'll stop updating. So then the algorithm has converged and it has find, found the optimal solution. In general, there might be noise. The reward might be noisy, the next state value might be noisy, so it might never exactly be zero. What the algorithm would then find is that it would be zero in expectation, which is exactly that term on the top. So we're still good. And it does so with small incremental updates. This alpha parameter that multiplies this term between the brackets is a small step size parameter. In the tabular case, if we store each value for each state action pair separately, this might be something like one tenth or something. And it just, the whole point is to average over the noise. If you're in a stationary setting, you might want to decay this over time to actually find an, uh, an optimal solution in the limit, because then the updates become smaller and smaller, and at some point you've averaged out all the noise and you're good. Note, though, that we're still bootstrapping. We're still using our previous state action values to bootstrap upon. This means that the update is actually non-stationary. So we can't, for instance, use a step size of 1 over t and then just average these things, because then we will be averaging quantities that include our all estimates. So instead, what we typically have to use is a step size that is somewhat larger. For instance, you could use a constant step size. Then you won't actually converge to the, to the true solution. You'll keep on like jittering a little bit but it will continue to adapt. And there's also choices in between those. Step sizes that decay, but not quite as fast as one over, one over t, um, that will eventually get the optimal solution. This algorithm, this temporal difference learning algorithm is called Q-learning, for historical reasons, um, where this is also where the letter Q comes from for these action value functions in general, by Chris, Chris, Chris Watkins. So Q-learning is actually doing something quite subtle and important. It's learning off policy. It's learning about the value of the greedy policy while following potentially a different policy. And it does so by doing this max in the next state. 
So essentially, it's already, the whole thing is already conditioned on the action, right? We pick a certain action AT in a state ST. We observe the reward, RT plus one. We observe the next state, ST plus one. And we're going to do this update. Now this update is already conditional on having taken that action. For each time we update this value, we have taken that action exactly. But in the next state, we're going to hypothesize that we're going to take the max value, which basically is equivalent to saying, we'll then hypothesize that in the next state, we'll be greedy with respect to our current action values. One way to think about this is that this is doing similar to value iteration, one step of evaluation and immediately of policy improvement, because we're looking at the greedy action value. This also means we're learning off policy, which is a term that is meant to, uh, it means that we're, we're, we're learning about a policy that we're not current, currently following. And what this means for Q-learning specifically is that we can approximate the optimal value function without ever following it. You can you could continue to explore indefinitely. And actually the proof for Q-learning says that you only have to, for the tabular case, if we store all these values separately, you only have to uh, make sure that your policy tries each action in each state infinitely often. It's a mild, mild restriction there. Uh, and then it will converge. It doesn't say anything about having to make your policy more and more similar to the optimal one. If we have the optimal value function, then again, we can very easily find the greedy policy. And therefore the optimal policy. Okay. Now this is all fine for the tabular case, but we want to make approximations because otherwise we won't have a, a practical algorithm. So uh, this is a short detour about approximating functions. So we want to learn policies, value functions, and our models in reinforcement learning. And each of these, as I said before, is a function. So policy fu is a function from state to actions, for instance. And we want to learn those. Now, learning a function from data is a very well-explored, well-understood research field. So many examples exist. Let's say we want to learn a mapping from some input state x to some output state y. And for instance, x could be an image, and y could be a label. Is there a cat or a dog in the image or something like that? Or x could be the pixels of a video game, and y could be a prediction of the future score. Maybe we're not trying to do control. Maybe we have some fixed policy. Maybe we're watching a human play. The data comes from a human playing, and we just want to make a prediction. So there's many of these examples. And our first approach would be maybe to do ta tables. We just do an entry for each of these individual inputs. And then we have these state action, sorry, these, uh, in reinforcement learning, we'd have state action pairs as inputs. So we'd have a separate value for each of these. And then in each of these cells of the tables, we can just update only that one cell whenever we've taken, say, that one action in that one state, and we get everything else fixed. Uh, that's maybe the easiest place to prove things, that it actually converges to the true values and what, whatnot, but it doesn't really scale well for, uh, for multiple reasons. One is you have potentially huge memory requirements, because you have to store this huge table for all of your states and actions. And you have potentially huge data requirements, because you have to update each of the cell in the, in the table enough times to get a valid estimate of its value. And you have no way to learn about unseen events. This means you have no generalization. So whenever you go to a new state and you try a new action, you have to learn its value basically from scratch. Lack of generalization basically implies slow learning. These, this is very related to the second point of huge data requirements. So what we'd actually want is whenever we learn something about a state value, we also kind of want to learn about similar states. This is what generalization is. So this is a very simple toyish example of that. Imagine we want to learn housing prices uh, we could use the average past sales of the prices per house. But if we use them separately for the individual houses, you get very little data. Like how often is a house sold in, say, a century even? Only a couple of times. So you get some data, but not that much. And because the underlying process is changing, it's non-stationary, if you just average, say, the ha past house pricing, that's obviously not going to give you a very good prediction. So what could you do instead? We want some generalization, and one possibility is to aggregate. You could cluster houses by streets or by size or by color. Maybe you know by in advance that some clusters are more meaningful or useful than others. Or some combination of these. You'd get more data by cl per cluster. For instance, if each cluster contains three houses rather than one, you already get a lot more data per cluster. But it's still no generalization across different clusters. So what we want to propose otherwise is something else where we have a bunch of features. And I'll use phi to, to, to refer to the features. And we'll try to learn a, a linear function off of those features. And this is maybe the simplest step up from tabular. This is now a linear approximation. 
where we simply say our value function or whatever function we're trying to predict here will be some linear weighted sum. And the point now becomes to learn these weights. This generalizes the tabular setting because you could, for instance, have a feature, a feature vector that is equally long as the number of states and actions that you have. And exactly one of them becomes one and the older others are zero whenever you're in that one state and action. Then it becomes the tabular case again. But you don't have to do that, right? You could have a better representation that allows for more generalization. In order to learn such a function, you need at least two things. One is an objective, a well-defined goal, what should this function represent? And the other is a learning algorithm, something that yields an update to the parameters. People often conflate these two, but they're separate things. One is the actual thing you want, and the other is what you use to get it. And in, in supervised learning and in deep learning, these are often specified by losses, which is a very good, flexible way to specify that. And then the goal is always basically to minimize the loss. And the algorithm is almost always, is all, also already almost given, as I'll talk about in a moment. And a very common loss is say to have a squared array. We just want our predictions to be close to the actual labels. So for some input to x, we have some parameters w that we're going to update that this function depends on. And then we want the function of the input x and the parameters w to be close to this uh, label y in expectation. And we could call y say the target. And the expectation here is over the pairs of inputs and outputs. As, again, in supervised learning, we often assume this, this, that this distribution will be uh, uh, identically uh, and independent. Uh, so it'll be stationary over time, and you can just sample from it independently. In reinforcement learning, that's not really the case. But the goal is then to minimize this loss for whatever this loss is. And one way to do that is to take gradients. Now, I assume many of you have learned about gradient descent, or maybe used it, or maybe extensively at some point or not. Um, but I'll briefly go through it. Um, the idea is quite simple. We basically say, uh, we take this loss, and we look at, for this loss, we can basically compute a gradient. Now, what is the gradient? It's the direction in which uh, the loss will go down the most for your current weights. That's what a, what a gradient is by definition. It's, it's the direction the vector points in, in, in terms of your rate space, it points in the direction of the steepest uh, ascent, actually. And then when we say gradient descent, we just put a minus in front and we say we go down rather than up. Now you can turn that into a stochastic update, and this is then called stochastic gradient descent. And it's a very powerful algorithm because of its simplicity, because you can often calculate these things quite easily. And it's an incremental algorithm in the sense that it's stochastic, so you'd better take small steps to average over the noise. But then if you do, you can actually prove many things about this as well. That it actually finds uh, the minimum, say, if your function is convex, which means, for instance, you have a linear function that you're trying to map, and then your loss is the squared loss, then your loss will be convex. And then in that, in that case, you'll actually find the optimal solution, eventually. Again, there's a step size, alpha. You have to appropriately decay the step size if you want to actually find the optimal solution, but then it, uh, then it just works. And so one thing I did here, I wrote it down here as a, as a minus, so we're the, the term here, the minus alpha and so on, this is the negative gradient of our, stochastic gradient of our loss. I typically like to flip these around uh, because then it reads to me as if we're updating towards the target. The goal is to make that term between the brackets zero, and if you update en en enough, this will happen in expectation, which means that this linear sum of the features will start to be equal in expectation to the label y. And the way you can read this is that the change in weight is a step size times a prediction error, y mi mi minus this uh, prediction that we're making, w times phi, times the features. That's for the linear case. Now this is a fairly simple algorithm, it's easy to code this up, but it's actually, actually quite strong and you can do many things with this, with suitably chosen features. Now this is a small example where, for instance, our feature vector is still a binary vector, but it's not one hot, there's not one component that is one, but actually there's two. For instance, maybe you have a, you don't just have a big house, but it's also a red house, so you have these two features that are, equal, uh, that are on at the same time. And maybe you have some initial guess for the weights, say 10, 20, 30, 50, 70, 
and you have some uh, actual observed target y, and then if you have some step size, we'll notice that two of these weights actually change. In a tabular setting, only one of them would change. In this case, two of them change, and it'll make your prediction better. These things are so common, so pervasive, that uh, they're made a lot easier these days. There's many modern software packages that calculate these gradients for you. So all you have to do is specify your function, you specify the loss, and then you just tell your software, and then I want to do gradient uh, descent. I forgot how it works, but you know how it works, you do it for me. Um, and that actually works quite well. It makes it possible for people um, to easily do lots of things, quite impressive things as well, without having to worry about having small software bugs. Because if you have to make a small, say, error in the calculation of the gradients, maybe it points in the wrong direction, things will get quite messy. Okay, so this brings us to deep learning. Um, because so far I've discussed linear functions, so what's wrong with linear? I said they were quite good, and they are. They're great when you have good features. But um, this, what does it mean to have good features? There's basically a couple of requirements that you have for your features, and the problem is that they're hard to guarantee in advance. One is that, you, uh, that suitable solutions are a linear combination of those features. Basically what I'm saying is, if you only have a linear function, you better, you better make sure that the appropriate solutions are within the space that you can represent. And additionally, you want them to facilitate fast learning, because the tabular setting, for instance, that one's linear, and if you have like a separate cell for each of the states, it's also fully expressive, but it doesn't generalize well, so it doesn't facilitate learning. So finding good features in general is a fairly hard, uh, hard thing to do, and there's lots of research on that as well. Although less so these days, for reasons I'll say in a moment. Um, but they might require substantial domain knowledge. So you might want to learn a lot about the domain you're trying to solve before you can even define a good feature representation and your solutions, the quality of your solutions and the speed with which you attain them, so the amount of data that you need, they very much depend on your choice in features. Now there is a different solution which is to learn these features. And this is more or less what happens in deep learning. There's two ways to look at it. One is to say deep learning helps you learn features. A different one is to say we're just going to define a different function class that is not linear, it's going to be nonlinear. And nonlinear is almost, is basically by definition, is more general than linear, which means it's a larger function class, which means it's more flexible. So it's much easier to define a function, uh, a nonlinear function class that has good solutions inside of it than it is to define a linear one. And in fact, what people often do is they define nonlinear functions, neural networks, that just consume the raw inputs. We don't even define features anymore. Because the function is allowed to be nonlinear now, we're not restricted to a linear function of the inputs anymore, which means they're very flexible, which means we can often find good solutions even if we don't do any feature engineering. And that's the main selling point, I guess. And now neural networks are basically just a flexible and broad class of nonlinear functions for all our intents and purposes. I mean, you could follow a whole class on deep learning and you'd learn much more richness than just this statement. But for our intents and purposes, that's what they are. Where the main idea, main idea is that they're built up hierarchically, which means there's a couple of steps of compute, typically in a neural ne network. And typically also we learn them end to end, which means that we just take grain with respect to this full nonlinear function and we try to incrementally, incrementally update the parameters in that fashion. You lose some guarantees when you do that because there's lots of guarantees for the linear case that we don't yet at least have for the nonlinear case. But you gain a lot in flexibility and in practice it works really well. Now how do we make a nonlinear function? Well one example is given here at the, uh, at the bottom schematically and in math. So the schematic here is meant to basically show that there's some input which are depicted as nodes where the nodes are just numbers. Say you have some features coming in or some raw pixels or whatnot. And then there's a bunch of lines into other nodes. These lines are basically the weights that we're, that we're learning. So one way to think of this is that we have a vector as an input and we multiply it with some weight matrix and this gives us a new vector. And then we repeat, we do this over and over. But if we'd only do that, we'd still have a linear function. So what we do instead, which is shown there on the right hand side, is that whenever we, we have multiplied our input uh, vector with some weight matrix, we then apply a nonlinearity. And these days, people often use a very simple one, which basically says, if the output of each of these nodes, if it's negative, I'll just set it to zero, 
And if it's positive, I'll just set it to whatever value it is. This is a nonlinear function, which lo looks like a hinge. And this, is, this has a couple of benefits to use this one, and it just happens to work well in practice. It's not a given that it'll stay that way. This thing might change. People are actively investigating other nonlinear functions. A lot of algorithms, they don't particularly care which nonlinearity you use, but it turns out in practice, this specific nonlinearity tends to work fairly well. Now, what does it mean? We have a nonlinear uh, space. So one thing that might happen, this is a, just a comical representation of what might happen, is that we have a loss function with some high loss there at the bottom left and some low loss, very low loss at the bottom right. Maybe that's zero there, the dark blue at the bottom, bottom right. But because we're following a local update, the gradient, we might actually be pulled to the top, uh, top right, where the loss is lower than where it currently is, but we're not actually finding the optimal solution. And this happens because now our loss uh, function is no longer necessarily convex. It can have multiple optima, which means think of a mountain range. If you go down a slope on a mountain range, you're not guaranteed to find the lowest value. That's essentially what's happening. So as I said, for our intents and purposes, a neural network is just a non-parametric nonlinear function. And sculpting and optimizing these functions is something of an art, which is the, what a lot of deep learning research is about. Uh, but it's also much easier now than it used to be because we have more compute, better simulators, better pre-built optimizers. People have uh, implemented these for you and better software packages like TensorFlow and others. Um, now, one function that we talked about is the uh, state update function. And this looks very similar, but this is actually meant to be a somewhat more generic statement. So one common way people use these nonlinear functions is for, to deal with sequences of inputs rather than just an instantaneous input. And one way to do that is to use a recurrent neural network, which consumes some inputs and the previous state of that, that network, and then outputs an output and the next state of that network. Now what this is essentially doing, this is combining in terms of the reinforcement learning setting, this is the way people typically write it down for recurrent neural networks, but for the, agent, for, the, for the reinforcement learning setting, we typically split it into multiple parts. We have one part, which you call the state update function, which only outputs the next state. And then we have separate parts, maybe multiple, that consume that state and give you the output. One might give you the policy, the other might give you a value function, maybe you have both of those. Maybe there's a model as well, there might be other functions there. Um, in deep learning, there's, these are typically combined because we don't necessarily care about them separately as much. Um, and you could also, of course, always write this down this way, because there's just a function that is well-defined, which consumes some inputs and gives you some outputs. Now we can learn this mapping by using something that is called backprop through time. This is just to cast a gradient descent, but we're making sure that we're accounting for the fact that this previous state was actually also the output of the same function, but on different inputs, which means you can pass this gradient all the way through multiple steps, but typically we use a fixed window for computational reasons. And what this might provide you is memory, because you then, are, then, you are, then it's possible to change this function in such a way that the output at many states later becomes good for some, according to some loss by changing something that you did many states before, by just following the gradient. One thing that is happening here is that the same weights might be in multiple places in this unrolled larger function. But that's okay. We can still define a gradient. We can still follow that gradient and it will still lead us somewhere. And this can potentially help us in the partially observable mark of decision processes. Now in general, deep learning is the research and practice of training neural networks. And it has many different parts. It's a very active area of research right now. There's mathematical parts, which are about picking the function per class, understanding the optimization process, uh, defining, deriving new optimizers, things like that. There's a lot of engineering as well, uh, tinkering in architecture space. Sometimes people find surprising things that work well without really necessarily understanding exactly why, right? And that's perfectly valid. And also how to include domain knowledge is active uh, area of research. And there's, of course, also the science. What, what happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? You can ask scientific questions about this and just observe it. Basically, think of it as a frog that you're poking. And then you just observe what happens if you poke the frog. And that then brings us to deep reinforcement learning. Um, by the way, which time do you normally end? Huh? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. So this will be the last part. <laughs> 
where we then combine these deep learning algorithms with reinforcement learning. And the idea is quite simple and quite obvious by now, I guess. We're going to use deep learning techniques to learn policies, values, and or models to use in a reinforcement learning domain. That sounds perhaps simpler than it is, but it's also not that hard. Where reinforcement learning provides a framework for making decisions and algorithms, and deep learning provides tools to learn certain components, most uh, specifically these functions. So then again, I've posed the question before with just RL, maybe AI is reinforcement learning plus deep learning? Still with a question mark, not going to take a stance on that. Um, but concretely, we'll just implement reinforcement learning components with deep neural networks, and then we'll just see what happens. So to go into detail on a specific um, version of that, I'm going to talk a little bit about deep Q networks. Now, what is a deep Q network? It's, uh, it, was, it, it is what was used to produce those Atari videos that I showed earlier, where you saw this agent play these Atari games. And essentially how it works is that it does Q learning, the same Q learning algorithm that I showed before, but now with the nonlinear function update, where the update to the weights will be proportional to some step size times a temporal difference error of your reward plus discounted maximum maximum value in the next state. So this is a form of value iteration, but a stochastic form of it, times the gradient of the current value estimate. So one way to think about this is it's kind of, uh, it's kind of trying to minimize the squared temporal difference error there between the brackets. But it's not taking the gradient with respect to the, to, the, to the value at the next state. And basically one way to think about that is that this is because of causality. We want to update the value of our action AT towards this target of the reward plus the value at the next state. But we don't want to change the value at the next state to be a better target for our current value because that violates causality. We only want to update in one direction, not the other. You could, you could do the other one thing as well, it just doesn't work as well in practice. And it's, uh, feels less intuitive. Now what is, this, what is this Q function here? It's some, some function that takes a state as input, an action as input, and a weight vector, or some weights. So what more specifically was this? Well, this was a deep uh, neural network. How does this deep neural network work? There's a couple of inputs. In this case, we're stacking a couple of frames, and that's all the memory that we'll use. So there will not be a state update function. We're just going to use the observation, but the observation will be your past four frames. And these are downsampled to be 84 by 84 pixels. This is why we get four times 84 times 84 inputs. Then we're going to apply a, uh, a linear function on top of that, which is something called a convolutional layer. And what a convolutional layer does, it looks at each little patch of the image with a small little filter that looks at, say, 8 by 8 pixels and multiplies those 8 by 8 pixels with some matrix to lead to a number of numbers. And this number of numbers is uh, a parameter, and in this case it was picked to be 16. And then you just multiply the, this little patch with that matrix, and you do that for every patch in the image, in this case by skipping over four, four pixels every time. So not on every pixel, but you skip over four, four pixels. But so you basically divide up the image into a lot of patches, and you apply the same linear function to all of these patches. Then you apply that nonlinearity that I showed you earlier, and this gives you a new set of uh, images, which in this case will be 16 images, which are now, um, uh, there's, th these are now 20 by 20. Because of the size of the filter that we used, um, that's a detail that's not really important, but you can repeat, re you can repeat that process, sorry, we do that again. And then at some point we basically say, okay, now we have a bunch of images, but they're not really images anymore. We're just going to stack them together, call them a feature vector, and then we'll apply another matrix multiplication to that. The details of this are not really important for this talk, but this is how this neural network was set up. And this is a, I, I can add, this is a fairly conventional, what they call a convnet for convolutional neural network. Nothing too special. Was of course tuned a little bit for the Atari setting, but there's nothing really fancy going on here in terms of deep learning. This is a fairly standard network. For our intents and purposes, the most important thing here is that some nonlinear function of the, of the pixels and is not too expensive to compute. Then, as said, this is trained by doing Q-learning. 
But there were a couple of in innovations in the original DQN uh, algorithm, which led to a Nature publication, um, one of which included using target networks, where basically we're, we're noting that if we're doing the, up, uh, the update up there, whenever we update the value of some state action pair, we might inadvertently also change the value at the next state because of generalization. We're using the same weights for all inputs to compute our action values. But if you do that, you might actually change values everywhere when you do some updates. That's a feature. We want that generalization because it helps speed up learning. But it can also lead to very awkward learning dynamics where things are spiraling away. One way to prevent that from happening is to fix the target a bit more. We're noting that the reward plus the discounted next state was just some stand-in for the actual optimal return, which we don't have. And we could do, that, do something a little bit more stable, where we make a copy of the online weights, W minus, it's just a copy of your normal weights, and we just keep it fixed for a while. And this turned out to be quite useful for performance. And another, uh, oh yeah, sorry, here's another slide on that. So the intuition on that is um, that changing the value of one action can change the value of many other actions in other states to change as well because of the generalization. And this ends up, means that the, the network can, as I said, chase its own tail or spiral out of control. A different mechanism from the DQN work was experience replay. Now this is a fairly straightforward thing, which basically just means whenever you interact with the environment, we're going to store those samples in some big database, and then we can replay those samples. What this means is that the actual uh, data that the neural network will consume, that the, the deep reinforcement learning algorithm will consume, will be a bit more similar to what you'd normally get in normal supervised regression, because it will be more IID, and it will also be more stationary in a sense, because it doesn't adapt that quickly to your changing policy. So the idea behind this, the motivation behind this, was to make it a little bit more like the supervised learning settings that we already knew works well with deep reinforcement, uh, sorry, with deep learning. And it turns out to be a lot more data efficient as well if you do it like this. There were many later improvements to DQN. This was like an active area of research and still is. Um, and I'll highlight a couple, which is more showing what, what, like, what ongoing research there was happening in deep reinforcement learning. And also to show some like, larger trends in that. So um, something that might not be immediately obvious is that this replay database, this stores a whole bunch of transitions, a state, an action, a reward, and a next state that you've actually observed. Now one way to interpret this is that it's basically an emp empirical non-parametric model. It's something we can sample from. Or if you, if you call it a model, you could actually also call this querying. It's a model we, we can query. In the original DQN paper, this was used to sample uniformly at random from. Now obviously that's a valid thing to do. You could just, you could just do that, you can define it, but it doesn't mean it's the optimal thing to do. And if you view this as a model, then there's a question whether we can use it more cleverly. And it turns out, yes, that you can. So one way, which I won't go into more detail on, you could use it to plan with. You could use the actual things that you've seen to basically do backups more often to see if you can, do, if you can learn more about this and to reason through these trajectories that you could be following. But the other one that I'll explain a bit more on, you can sample non-uniformly. You can pick things that you want to learn about. And one simple way to do that, this was explored by uh, some of my colleagues at DeepMind, is to replay transitions proportional, so you pick them more often, uh, to the error that they have. Sorry, I see the W, the weights of the network, are thetas here. Both are used quite often in the literature, so I missed one. But it's just the parameters of the network. Theta is just the parameters of the network here. It's the thing we're updating. Um, and if you do this, turns out this learns a lot faster and a lot better. And the intuition behind this is that there's, um, when there's a high temporal difference error, this is typically something that you can still learn a lot about. That's not necessarily the case. If it's a stochastic environment, you might have a high temporal difference error just because of noise. But in this case, in Atari, actually the environment isn't very stochastic or isn't stochastic at all. And then this is a very uh, plausible thing to do. You could define other ways to sample, of course, and I'm not saying that this is the optimal way to sample, but it turns out that if you sample like this, it's already a lot better than if you sample uniformly at random. 
it makes intuitive sense as well if you think about the update, because the update will be proportional to this value, to the, to the magnitude of this value. So if you sample things where this value is zero, you're basically not doing an update, you're wasting compute. So if you only sample the things where this is high, you're wasting much less compute, you're doing much more updates. It will change the dynamics of learning, but turns out in general this just helps. Yeah? When you have a, like, a huge uh, uh, replay memory, yeah. do you update this file for each item in the replay memory? Like, do you sort them, uh, all of them, so you go through the whole memory again? Yeah, sorry, no. Um, so do we update the whole replay memory? Do we go through it like dynamic programming style, maybe update all of them at, at the same time or anything like that? Uh, we typically don't. We typically store a fairly large replay memory, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or maybe even a million transitions. And then um, we sample from those, and we do that while acting in the environment. So what's the, typical, the actual typical setup that was also used in DQN is that at every four steps in the environment, you sample 32 transitions at random from your replay, and you update your network with those. And the new samples all just get added to the replay, so we don't even use those immediately necessarily to update. We just store them in the replay, and eventually they'll get sampled. And because we're sampling 32 samples every four steps, we're actually going to see each transition on average eight times. Of course, randomly we will see some more often than others, but that's, uh, uh, those, are, so those are the actual numbers that we used. So we might, might actually not see any of, some of the samples we might not actually see ever at all, just by chance. And especially if you do this, it becomes more likely that that happens, because you'll sample things with a high error more often. Of course, when you do sample them, we'll update, the error might go down, you store them with a lower error now, so you might not choose them again, but things that got stored in the replay memory with zero error, error you might actually not sample at all. And that might be okay. Randomly. So wh where do the numbers come from? These are just, uh, many of the numbers, there's many numbers. This is a fairly complex system, right? There's many specific numbers. The size of the filters in the convolutional layers, there's the exploration, there's the step sizes, there's the numbers of the batches as you were asking about. Many of them were very roughly tuned or just picked because it's what, much too large a space to do an exhaustive search in. Well, so do you have to do that for any problem? A little bit of tuning, yes, you have to do for any problem. Um, it does turn out to be the case that these days, oh, that these days many methods are quite robust. Um, for instance, this, this work was using uh, RMS prop, which is a type of optimizer. Um, it's basically an extension to uh, stochastic gradient descent. These days, many people use a different optimizer, which is quite similar, which is called Atom. And that one turns out to be very robust in the sense that you can apply it to many problems and you don't really have to tune the, param like the hyperparameters of that optimizer that much anymore. But then, if you do, the performance will change a little bit. So it's always the case that if you have a certain problem and if you tune all these parameters a little bit more, you will probably be able to iterate your performance upwards. It might not be big gains, but you will be able to do a little bit better at least. And this is, this is indeed a little bit, you're touching upon something that is a little bit of a problem. But it's also kind of inherent. These are complex systems with lots of knobs and we are not able to set all of them optimally. So we're going to have to do a little bit of search. But then how can you make sure that uh, this generalization or this undesirable generalization that you talked about is not going to happen? If you don't uh, learn or train your network uh, over this whole uh, experience that you gain? Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you don't train on all your experiments, you might get undesirable learning dynamics, and this is true, and sometimes it happens. And actually, let me show you an example, for, which is for a different reason, but let me show you that these things can go out of control. Um, there are, basically there are no guarantees, but it often works quite well. So that's, that's the current state of affairs. It might be a bit of an unfortunate state of affairs, but it works so well that it's still interesting. But let me show you an example for when things might fail. Um, first, I'll give you the solution, then I'll show you the failure. Um, so this is the DQN algorithm, which we had up there before. The change in weights is proportional 
to the step size times the temporal difference error times the gradient of your function. Now, this is not actually the case. As I just mentioned briefly, we weren't actually using stochastic gradient descent, but instead we were using something called RMS prop, which is a slight modification to this. But that's kind of irrelevant for the point I'm going to make next, but it's just so you're aware. So this will be the stochastic gradient descent version of DQN. Now you can write that differently and it might make it a little bit more obvious of what's going on. So we take, a, we take an action in a certain state, we see a reward R, we see next state S prime in this slide, and what do we do then? We update towards the value of that immediate reward plus the value in the next state of the greedy action in that state. So we're maxing now over the state action values. We're doing an arc max to pick out the greedy action and then we're evaluating that greedy action. But what we're doing is actually a little bit dangerous because what we're actually doing is we're using the same action values to pick an action and then to evaluate it but we're still learning these action values. So they're going to be inherently noisy and approximate and wrong. Now let's assume you have a bunch of different action values and they're all a little bit noisy. So if you're going to pick the greedy value there, if you're going to max over those, you're more likely to pick an action that you've overestimated than you are to pick an action that you've underestimated. So can we do something else? Well, yeah, you could. So this is reusing the fact that we have two networks. We were updating the online network with the uh, bolded black W in the top line. And we have this target network, as we called it, which is a slower moving copy of that network. And now what we could do instead is we could still use that target network, but instead of evaluating the greedy action according to the target network, we could evaluate the greedy action according to the online network. These two networks will have slightly different predictions because we're only intermittently updating the target network, say every 10,000 steps or something like that. And this decorrelates the selection of the action and the evaluation and turns out this is already enough to mitigate that overestimation. And that, that is true, we can see that here. So these are value estimates on two Atari games, Wizard of War and Asterix. You don't need to know anything about those games in order to understand this slide. And what you see at the top here are value estimates according to these action values that the agent has learned. And what you see here is that this is on a log scale and we see at least that DQN has much larger value estimates than uh, double DQN, which uses that last update down here. But this turns out not just to be a higher value. Well, why could these values be higher? Maybe you're just doing better, right? Maybe the is just better and therefore the value estimates are higher because the actual returns are higher. That turns out not to be the case. Because the actual scores, they actually drop and they drop almost exactly at the point where these value estimates from DQN go up. This is because of that bias that we've just discussed. And we can see that because double DQN doesn't have that problem. Here the values do go up, less high than DQN but the scores also go up and they seem very correlated. And indeed, I don't have that line here, but if you compare the value estimates with the, we also compare the value estimates with the true discounted future return from that point onwards. And then we see that double DQN is much more accurate than DQN. The actual value for DQN will actually be lower than that of double DQN, even though it's, uh, it's estimating a much larger value. So apparently this is a real bias that is also hurting performance because the performance is really tanking there, for instance, on asterisk for DQN. And then, uh, so if you compare this across the whole suite of Atari games, this is what DQN got, where the bars here re represent uh, normalized scores, where we took uh, a human game tester and he played these Atari games. And whatever score this human tester got, we, we set that at 100%. And we had a random agent, just pick random actions, we set that at zero. And then we can compare across different games, we can see how close we are to that 100% that the human tester got on the games. And that's actually the first line here in the system, in, 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 this, uh, in this plot, which is the human performance line. And you see that on many games it's actually much better. This is also a log line behind uh, after 100, but it's linear on the left, I think, before 100. And on many games it's very close, and on some games it's actually worse than human, and in some games even worse than random, um, which is a bit... <laughs> um, but then if we apply this double DQN trick, which is basically one line of code change, but it's of course an informed line change, we can see that it does a lot better, basically across the board. And some of the games that were sub-random also got uh, higher. So in some cases it might have been sub-random because this overestimation bias basically made it go all the way haywire and made it go into uh, wrong solutions. <laughs> 
So take home message here, apart from the, like, the instance of the algorithm is that it's good to be aware of the actual properties of your learning algorithm. Don't use them as black box. Don't just plug them in and hope for the best, right? But understand what they're doing and then you can improve them. It's also very useful to track and analyze the statistics because if you could see these values ex escape and go off into unrealistic estimates, then maybe you could stop there and think about, oh, there's something happening here. Maybe I could understand what that is. And if you understand the problem, sometimes the solution is very simple. So in this case, maybe the, the coming up with it maybe is not the trivial part, but the implementation of double DQN is like a one-line change of code to the DQN algorithm, and it leads to a huge improvement in performance. Similar things have happened many times in the past. So it's good to try to understand the low levels of what's going on, and one way to do that is to track and plot lots of stuff if you ever want to play with these things. Um, I think I have time for one last topic, and then I'll end. Um, sorry? Yeah, minus five minutes. Minus five. So I have, I have time for no last topics. Um, yeah. Okay. So we could end here if you want. Um, unless everybody wants to continue. But, yeah. So maybe anybody who wants to or has to leave could also leave and I could just... This is just going to be a sep separate little topic on the, on the whole, whole topic of deep reinforcement learning, which is uh, related to a larger narrative. Um, so you could understand everything up to now without going into this. And this is going back to the reward function. So we've defined rewards uh, in Atari as this change in score. There's other different ways you can define rewards. For instance, on the, the game of Go, you could define it as a win or a loss, and you could just say plus one for a win, minus one for a loss. It's a very clear definition. In DQN, turns out all the rewards were clipped to minus one, one. So why? Well, this helps learning. And why does it help learning? Well, these deep networks, they have all these parameters that we were talking about before, such as the step size and such. And turns out if you can make the problems much more uniform, make them look all alike, then it's much easier to set these, set these hyperparameters so that you can use the same hyperparameters across all of these games. That was an explicit goal for the work on DQN, that the same algorithm could learn each of these games. But it does change the objective, and sometimes harmfully so. Now, is there a way around that? There is. Um, instead of clipping the rewards, we tried an algorithm that adaptively normalizes the target to lie within the range of minus one one, say, or to be roughly normally distributed. Now here on the right hand side, what you see is a picture of the unclipped gradient norms. So this is the updates to the weights that you get, or your update is typically proportional to this, that you get across all these different Atari games. So there's a bunch of little dotted lines in there. Each of those dotted lines is for a specific Atari game. And then there's a bunch of colored regions. These are basically percentiles, like 50, 80, 90 percentiles across these games. This is 57 games, so there's fairly meaningful percentiles. What we see if we don't clip the rewards, the gradient norms are like span seven orders of magnitude. It's very hard to come up with a learning algorithm, a stable learning algorithm that can deal with this variety. If we clip the rewards, everything's much more stable. This is the middle plot here. But it turns out if you use the adaptive normalization, which we call Popart, it's even a, a smaller range. And interestingly, this is without changing the objective. Because when you clip the rewards, you change the objective. But what we're doing instead is we're basically, it's sometimes called whitening, and it's very often used in deep learning on the input level, but we're doing something similar, but then on the target level. And this turns out to stabilize the gradient norms quite a bit, which hopefully then makes learning easier. And then when we apply this to the Atari game, something interesting happened. This is the relative performance of using that normalization versus not using that normalization across all of these Atari games. And turns out like the net median or mean performance difference is about zero, which was quite surprising and coincidental. Um, but look at the y-axis here, the normalized differences. Remember that 100% is the difference between random and a human tester. So that's quite substantial. So what we see that a lot of, a lot of games got a lot worse and a lot of games got a lot better. And then there's a bunch of games in the middle that didn't change that much. So what's going on there? Why, why is it happening? Well, um, let me see. Uh, it won't work. Um, 
There's a video there, you can also find it on my website. Essentially what happens on, uh, on say, Pac-Man, this is one of the games that got better. And what happens in Pac-Man is if you clip the rewards, Pac-Man goes around this maze, eats the pellets, it can eat power pellets that can then turn the ghosts into something it can chase as well, and then it can eat the ghosts. And if you clip the rewards, Pac-Man cannot see the difference in the reward between eating a pellet and eating a ghost, so it doesn't care. So it just goes for the pellets. Those are just there, you just eat them, you're happy. But if you don't clip the rewards and use this adaptive normalization to still stabilize the learning process, Pac-Man basically becomes a ghost hunter. It goes for the power pellet, it goes, chases the ghost, goes for the other power pellets, it waits for them at the entrance, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, and then the, the overall score here on Pac-Man is better. But there's other games, and there's actually, uh, there's a link there. Um, you can see that on my website. There's other games in which the score got a lot worse, and often this is quite interpretable. There's a game somewhere down here called Time Pilots, and in that one, uh, you're flying around, it's a shooter game, you're playing and you're flying around, you're shooting things, and normally it just shoots everything when you clip the rewards. But if you don't clip the rewards, it actually doesn't care so much about shooting everything, it seems somewhat lackluster, until it spots a, spots a blimp, and then it goes for the blimp, it really tries to shoot it. Where the clipped one didn't care, and the reason is when it shoots the blimp, it goes to the next level. But then the next level, it even looks different. Like the background is a different color, there's other enemies, everything's different. So it's hard to generalize from this first level to the second one. And it turns out in total, the score is lower. But I would argue it's still doing the right thing in a sense. It's trying to play the game as the way it was intended. It just happens to be the case that the rest of our algorithm isn't quite good enough to then fully learn policies that are really good for this full game with the changing levels and everything. Similarly on Breakout, you can find that the clipped version uh, just hits all the blocks and at some point learns this tunneling, but before it learns the tunneling, it doesn't really care about which blocks it hits. Whereas the unclipped version, it really tries to hit the higher blocks quickly because those are worth more points. And again, this is harder and turns out the overall performance is actually a little bit worse. But where this really shines is for multitask learning. So before, DQN was actually a single algorithm that could learn each of these Atari games separately, so you would just learn from scratch, and it, the same algorithm could learn each of these games, but you could also try learning all of the games with a single algorithm, which is quite, um, it's quite an, a hard thing to do. Um, this is maybe even not really possible if you do, don't do something like this, because now the same algorithm needs to consume all these different reward skills. Of course you could still clip, that might help, and this is one thing you could try. But the other thing to do is to, to adaptively normalize, and then you can also trade off these different losses from these different games, and basically say maybe they're all equal. So what we did is we took an agent, we made it play all of these Atari games, basically at once, in parallel, and then see how far we can get. And this is what happened. Here the orange lines at the top are a baseline agent with this adaptive normalization. The agent itself, I won't go into detail, it's basically a version of, um, reinforce or A to C if these terms mean anything to you. If they don't, don't worry about it. It's not a Q-learning based agent, it's a policy gradient based agent, which I hadn't had time to talk about, but uh, it's a it's well, well known reinforcement learning agent. So those are the baselines in uh, blue and in uh, pink there in the middle. And when we apply this adaptive normalization, we see that it got a lot better. And in fact, this is the first known agent that can sol solve all of the Atari games above human level. And this is very recent work, so you kind of get scooped here. Um, more impressively even, when we, this is with clipped rewards, the middle lines. If we do unclipped rewards, the baselines, they just stay at zero. They're, they're, they're not precisely zero, I can tell you, but it just tanks. It doesn't, doesn't do anything. And this makes complete sense, right? Because some of these games, they have rewards in the thousands or even in the millions, and other games have rewards of one or two. So it's very hard to come with a single, to have a single system that can consume, consume all of those and learn about them. So what you can maybe more likely do is to find a system that can learn maybe one of these games, the one with the highest magnitudes, and all the others just won't care, just won't learn a good solution for it. This adaptive normalization allows you to instead uh, uh, reason about these things more or less as being equally important. Or you could weigh off the importance however you want, rather than having the magnitude of the reward uh, dictated for you. Okay, so this is where I then wanted to end. Thank you all for the attention. <laughs>